Hello English students and welcome again to Excel English. Uh, you may be watching this video as part of a series of video lessons looking at multimodal texts. Um, you should hopefully have already watched the introduction video on French milk because this video will be focused on a guided annotation of the text. Um, this will only be useful for you if you have your text ready to annotate. Uh, you have a pencil or whatever it is you use to annotate your text. Um, you should also have already read the text yourself. There's certainly no point in um, undergoing a guided annotation without having um, already looked at the text yourself um, because obviously you know this analysis will be meaningless um, unless you're actually familiar with the text being analyzed okay without further ado let's jump in um, if we look at this first panel um, we see that there is one single image uh, combined with text that kind of runs down the side. A full page panel like this is known in the comic world as a splash page. Um, and this is a splash page with a focus of um, Nisley's passion for comic art. Uh, the representation of characters from Tintin is foregrounded centrally in the middle of the text and the, and the text uh, kind of moves around it. Um, I would call this an example of intertextuality. Um, Nisley here is referencing this comic tradition of which she is such a strong admirer. Um, this isn't Tintin, this is a tribute to Tintin and therefore an example of intertextuality, one text referencing another. In terms of the format of this text, we have this little um, box caption at the top which represents the text as a diary entry um, and that's significant because that's a repeated uh, feature of the discourse structure of this of this text. Um, Nicely is mostly using a capitalized lettering, which is um, which is uh, the sort of standard typography for um, for uh, comic texts. But she does occasionally mix in lowercase, as you can see in the word Pompidou there. So there's this sort of deviation from the standard uh, comic orthography, which is, I think, helping to represent her own idiosyncratic and imperfect style. This text is um, it's quite sketchy. It's quite loose. Uh, it has its imperfections, and I feel that this is also linked perhaps to Nisley's self-representation. This isn't a highly edited, highly polished, perfected text, just as Nisley doesn't present herself as a kind of a perfect individual. She has her own what we might call idiosyncratic uh, flaws in the text. Um, she uses throughout these initials uh, and the initial is the larger capital at the start of sentences. Um, this is a traditional way of starting paragraphs and it helps I think to guide the reader's eye especially where there are, is a, like irregular um, line structure or irregular paragraphing. So these act as a kind of a visual aid um, but they're also a feature of discourse in that uh, where you see an initial you're expecting some kind of topic shift uh, because you realize that that initial is uh, is uh, delineating a uh, a new paragraph um, there's a feature that that you can analyze throughout uh, this uh, diary format which is um, that nicely is often omitting the subject from her sentences uh, for example the very first uh, line in this page started off the day with a visit to the Pompidou um, normally you would have a subject in this sentence it would be I started off or we started off or they started off there would be someone doing the starting off Instead, we actually get this um, fragmented and quite informal feature, uh, which is repeated throughout the extract. Um, started off, saw a... Now, I think in a, a personal diary entry, uh, a writer can obviously assume that it's being written either for, uh, for themselves or for a very limited audience who will know that they themselves are the subject of the sentence and so that subject is omitted. But it helps create a very specific uh, uh, register appropriate for a diary entry. Let's have a closer look at some of the language in here, particularly the way that she represents Hergé and his work. Um, Nisley's language here is, uh, is using a hyperbole. Um, we get this intensifying adverb incredibly and this repeated adjective gorgeous which is helping to convey her passion for the works. She also uses uh, uh, an idiom all-time greats which is uh, somewhat cliched and that is a way of her representing her own authority on the subject. In my opinion one 
one of the all-time comics greats. It kind of implies that she has um, looked at, so she she understands all of the comics available, and that uh, she has like a broad knowledge of this um, field of art. We also get this opinion um, hedged, but with that adverbial subclause in my opinion. So um, although she's presenting herself as an authority on the subject. Um, she's also uh, making us aware that she's presenting her own subjective opinion and that she's open to debate. So this is obviously um, a feature of the text or a focus of the text that is aimed particularly at people who are interested specifically in comics and people who might be interested in debates about who the greatest comic uh, uh, writers or artists are. We then get this little parallel rhetorical um, construction, the detail that really makes the work. Almost sounds like an advertising slogan. Um, it does have a rhetorical function. It's a parallelism which draws attention to um, uh, Hergé's, the, art, the artist for Tintin, Hergé's skill. Um, we could also point out Tintin's uh, emanata, the use of punctuation marks around his head, sort of a distinctive style and again part of her sort of visual tribute to Tintin. There's also a semantic field within this uh, extract um, connected to art and uh, to comics. We have drawings, exhibit, showcase, resin and installation later as she talks about some of the artworks that she's seen in, um, in the Pompidou Centre. Clearly Nisley is someone who knows how to, uh, who, who, who understands the language of art and is able to use that in her writing. And that also reflects in her audience. Her audience are probably quite broadly culturally aware people who perhaps are interested in different forms of creativity and artistic expression. Uh, in the next panel, we get a, a photographic panel uh, and the only photographic representation in our extract, although I believe there are others in the full text. So this is an example of mixed visual modes. Um, even within the visual, there are different um, uh, mixed modes. Uh, here we have also a, a slightly odd feature uh, of language in that she chooses the uh, play script conventions to represent a snippet of speech between her mum and herself. So this is um, unpunctuated direct speech, but it's presented using play script conventions. So the speaker is identified uh, before the speech um, with a colon to show what they are saying. And the nature of this uh, language is quite personal. In fact, it's highly personal. It's um, her reflect, or her mum telling her about uh, when her father and, and she tried to conceive. So I think by including highly personal information, Nisley is showing her preparedness to be very candid and very open um, with her reader. Um, and it's offering the intimacy, I suppose, of a private diary. Um, we could use conversational analysis um, if you uh, check the playlist for um, videos on analyzing spoken discourse. If you're familiar with the theories in pragmatics um, and particularly how those can be applied to analyzing spoken discourse, we can look at her response to being told that mum tried to conceive her in this building as using um, a, a fragmentation and ellipsis, this kind of stunted response that flouts the maximum of quality. And there's an implicature there which is conveying the awkwardness of the topic. Um, Nisley presents that perhaps she doesn't have much to say about this um, and um, who can blame her. It's a sort of a, a strange thing to be thinking of. In the next slide we have what looks uh, like a, a typical uh, Parisian setting and an evocative Parisian setting and um, you know I think uh, one that perhaps you might have identified or you might be able to identify as Paris um, even without the linguistic clues. Again it's a splash page uh, of an evocative Parisian setting but significantly it's presented at a first person perspective. It looks like an eye level perspective piece and that's relevant because the language is also of course in the first person perspective. 
The panel itself is rich in different sensory imagery, and some of that's being conveyed um, through the uh, visual aspect, and some of that's being conveyed through the language. So we have the emanata there from the streetlight, implying the darkness. We also have this curious little uh, labeling of the cobblestones, which seems uh, like an attempt to add a little bit of realist detail um, to the text, or perhaps Nisley just wasn't that confident that she'd accurately represented cobblestones and felt the need to label it to make sure that we knew what we were looking at. Again, we make the point that this isn't a perfect text. It's very idiosyncratic. It's very quirky. Um, in this text, or in the, in, the, in the text accompanying this panel, the dexis is establishing a chronological narrative. Uh, there's temporal dexis afterwards, then and as, and the spatial dexis back, suggesting this, um, this is part of a, a journey, part of a movement, part of their days traveling around, and that they're returning back at the end of a day. Uh, Nisley is using a lot of value-laden adjectives. So these are adjectives, I guess, that present um, a kind of a personal opinion. And these are presenting a personal perspective of the events, uh, particularly the food that she eats. It's amazing. It's fresh. It's gorgeous. But she also has a taste for diminutives. We have teeny and little. And these, I suppose, are presenting... Um, the, the setting um, presenting Paris as uh, intimate or quaint. Um, Teeny is an interesting one. It, of course, is um, informal, but it's also a feature of child-directed speech. Uh, and this is retaining quite a youthful, uh, almost naive-sounding register in the text. And it's a feature that we will actually see elsewhere as well. On this, I think the fourth page, um, the focus now turns to um, Nisley herself and her own relationship with her boyfriend. And that's made clear because Nisley foregrounds herself at the very top of the page. Um, she uh, does that with this distinctive emanata. Remember, emanata is this uh, use of symbolism around the head of a character to focus you on their, um, their kind of a mental response. Um, this emanata is distinctive. The word fume, the infinitive verb um, to fume, uh, meaning uh, to be, or in this in this context, uh, meaning to be extremely angry. Um, and that's also represented in the typography because we get this kind of, um, you know, uh, like edgy, sharp, um, wavy, almost um, un unbalanced um, typography. Um, and that's immediately before you read any of the text you realize that combining that with her facial expression you realize that there's a kind of an emotive tone to this um, particular panel and to this particular page we then get a chronological sequence of events uh, which are in the past perfect tense and using first person inclusive perspective um, including these uh, adjacent structures as she goes um, adjacent to parallel structures sorry as she goes on to uh, explore Paris and you look down um, we get um, we rode the train over the Eiffel Tower but the crowds were too much to handle for long we walked along the Champs Elysees but the crowds were even worse there so two parallel sentences foregrounding this contrast between what you expect or your expectations of Paris and this reality of the crowds. Um, this is a theme that we've seen represented in other individual accounts of Paris, of course contrasted perhaps with um, those texts that try to sell or promote Paris. It's worth looking a little bit more closely here at the language she uses to represent her relationship and also to self-represent uh, because it's quite distinctive. Um, she says um, that she was pretty upset by a condescending reply email from John rebuking her or rebuking me from being homesick when I've been given an opportunity as if I didn't already feel guilty about not being thrilled. Um, her language here is changing perhaps or is, is distinct compared to some of the other language uh, that's, uh, that's featured in this extract and it's worth looking at why and how that's achieved. So first of all we get this um, moderate intensifying adverb and yes I know that moderate and intensifying are almost um, uh, are almost opposites but she uses this pretty upset um, as a way of hedging her views about her boyfriend. I think this is euphemistic. I think she's really upset. I think she's seriously upset because well 
fume. Um, so this choice of pretty upset, I feel, is a kind of a euphemistic understatement. And that, to me, seems to be an aspect of spoken register that's lowering the formality of the text. Um, it seems like this is the way um, someone would tell you personally about a disagreement that they had. Um, she then goes into the details of her argument with her boyfriend, and the language used here is interesting. We get this value-laden adjective, uh, condescending, which gives her... Um, opinion about how he has spoken to her. Uh, condescending is, well, that's an example of, um, I guess, a fairly rarefied Lexis. Um, she, her language, condescending and rebuking, are actually, um, is actually very precise. She, she has um, the, her, her, the, this sort of emotive semantic field. Um, she uses um, some very exact um, terms. She uh, reports the speech act of being rebuked, um, of being, i.e. told off, that is a speech act, and that's reported with that verb rebuking. And that, I think, implies how patronised she felt by his attitude. She then presents a snippet of his own speech. She presents his punctuated direct speech in a way to kind of add credibility to her account, to give us an actual taste of what was said to her. Um, and I think we're supposed to agree that that's a terrible thing and he shouldn't have said that to her. Um, it adds credibility to her position that she's been condescended to. And then finally, we get this um, a, a kind of rhetorical feature of understatement where she says the opposite of what she actually feels. Uh, and that conveys the irony of her situation. Um, this is what we might call litotes, um, as if I didn't already feel guilty about not being thrilled. So she's expressing the opposite situation um, as if I, everything was OK, as if everything was fine. Actually, she is saying, I do feel guilty um, because I'm not thrilled. So um, by expressing it um, in the opposite way to the way that it is, um, I suppose this is a way of highlighting the kind of irony um, of her situation that she feels she's being told things that uh, she didn't need to hear. Finally, then we get this. Kind of, she finishes this argument off. Um, she uh, frames uh, her description of the argument with her boyfriend with this rhetorical question, which brings um, it, the focus away from her relationship with her boyfriend and back to Paris in quite a knowing and self-aware way. Uh, the rhetorical question: Isn't it part of Paris in the winter to be brooding? Um, she's acknowledging this romantic Parisian cliche: Paris and the seasons. Um, but she's using the, the present participle verb brooding to actually describe her own actions. And that's conveying a degree of self-awareness in that perhaps she perhaps she knows that she's actually overreacting somewhat. Um, there's an element of self-deprecation here where she's perhaps looking at herself with a sense of um, detachment. Um, and I think that helps us to um, understand her viewpoint and also to relate to her a little bit more closely because she seems to be aware that she's overreacted in this situation. The next panel is in a kind of an abstracted panel describing her mum and the way that her mum likes to wake up and be um, fully active first thing in the morning. Um, the topic marker in the little caption box with the arrow there establishes mum as the focus of this page and the caption I guess is deviating from this diary format. Um, this isn't, doesn't seem to be happening on a particular day so this is more of a general reflection on her personal relationships rather than a specific event. Um, we get this uh, this interesting presentation and spatially the way that things are laid out on the screen here is, is quite interesting. Um, uh, we've got, I guess, a series of chronological panels um, that show how very quickly her mum becomes an unbearable presence in the morning. Um, in order to present this, there's a mixture of visual and text. And particularly um, standing out is this distinctive uh, typography. Um, full steam ahead is an idiom that is borrowed, I guess, from trains, I would assume, um, but has become 
become an idiomatic phrase that describes anything that is um, kind of to the maximum. And Nisley's presented this with a distinctive typography of underlining and oversizing it, which is a way of foregrounding the focus of this part of this page on her mum's extreme behaviour. We then get this torrent of um, speech bubbles representing her mother's speech directly, and they're mostly a series of questions, um, most of which don't have answers, um, although Nisley does represent some conversation in the end where she's responding, I don't know, uh, and just let me sleep. We can offer a pragmatic analysis of this conversation. We love to use pragmatics to analyse spoken discourse. And here, Nisley herself is um, uh, flouting maxims of manner and quantity. Um, mm is flouting the manner of maxim because that isn't English. Uh, it's just grunting. Um, and that's not the expected way that we uh, respond in conversations where we are cooperating. Um, she's also uh, flouting the manner of quantity because she isn't actually answering the questions. She's giving deliberately, um, deliberately short responses. Uh, why is this? Well, the implicature for flouting these maxims is showing that she is overwhelmed by her mother's speech and that this is an unwelcome conversation. Um, we normally talk about Grice's maxims in terms of um, in terms of the cooperative principles of speech. This is an example of, I guess, uncooperative conversation in that Nisley is showing how she doesn't want to cooperate in talking with her mum about these things. Uh, finally, then at the bottom, um, there's this uh, hyperbolic metaphor of Olympic caliber, which I think is quite humorous, um, describing her mum uh, waking up in the morning as if it was an Olympic event. This is an informal and idiosyncratic kind of register. It's um, quite humorous. She also uses this verb grumping. Uh, which is an example of kind of linguistic creativity. She's taken the adjective grumpy and turned it into a verb. You are grumping someone. It's a non-standard usage, but it's creative and it seems affectionate um, and a kind of a unique use of language relevant to Nisley. By this point in the text, Nisley has already explored her relationship with her boyfriend and already explored her relationship with her mother, neither of which um, are perfect. Uh, she's also explored the setting of Paris. And in this page, um, all of those elements uh, kind of come together with a focus on combination of Paris as a romantic location and also on Nisley's personal relationships with her boyfriend and her mother. Um, there's a variety of um, linguistic presentation and visual presentation in this particular slide, uh, in this particular uh, page, sorry. Uh, this combines direct speech and direct thought through the speech bubbles and the thought bubbles. And it's always worth identifying that there's a difference in tense um, between the, what's presented directly um, and what's presented um, as a kind of a narrative reflection. So the narrative commentary is in the past tense that describes the setting and the sequence of actions during this day. Um, but it also uses the present, this narrative commentary. She expresses her feelings um, in the present tense. I am in Paris without my lover or I like cool cars. And it's worth thinking about a diary format and the way that a diary is written. A diary entry is normally written um, usually, I guess, in the evening after the completion of a day. So this is perhaps nicely looking back on the events of the day in the past tense, but also looking at her present feelings, which at the time of writing remain kind of unresolved and current feelings. She has, I would say, a somewhat juvenile register. Um, I didn't really want to call it childish, but it is sometimes quite childish. Um, but uh, a juvenile register um, a young register, a uh, representation maybe of her innocence, uh, lack of experience and her naivety in relationship. She refers to, um, to the opposite sex as boys. Um, she um, said they peaked um, at some cars, which I think is, is quite juvenile uh, register. She refers to her mother as mom. Uh, now, obviously, that's distinctive um, American dialect. Um, 
US English, but also I think it's um, somewhat juvenile and she describes herself as um, being mad. I think this is a juvenile register. These, uh, this register and this language combines um, with the visual images um, in this slide that help to present her relationship within the narrative. So her facial expression in the first panel and in the second panel the image of the closeness between her and her mother, them walking um, hand in hand representing this romantic, uh, rep uh, giving this romantic representation, I beg your pardon, of Paris. Here's a shopping list. Sketches in abstraction of things that they have been buying. And that's an example I would call, I would call this an example of intertextuality. Uh, and this is a highly flexible text that can combine different genres. Here, it's a non-fiction genre. Um, the items, as I said, are sketched in abstraction from their setting, and like like shopping lists, this is a list of concrete nouns. But there are also um, orthographical features. Um, there's a there's a kind of a uh, a shopping list register at play here. Uh, the abbreviation of the chicken uh, w slash meaning, of course, with this abbreviation. Uh, the ampersand um, uh, often used to uh, shorten items in a list. And these are common in functional texts where they're convenient uh, tools for creating lists. Um, we also have that opening sentence which still frames the shopping list uh, in the kind of the diary, uh, in the diary form. Uh, but again, the subject is missing. Spent most of today in our now familiar market. Um, we spent would be the um, the grammatically standard version of that, but in the context of a diary shorthand register, this is great. She also uses uh, exclamation and this determiner uh, more cornichon, um, which I think is um, displaying her passion or the sense of excitement that she feels about eating Parisian gherkins. Uh, second to last page, the penultimate page here, there is um, quite a dense page in which Nisley really explores her passion for literature, uh, for comics, but also um, the way that she respects the Parisian literary tradition. So there's a juxtaposition of setting and her personal memories. So this is a combination, I guess, of both Paris and Nisley um, and her self-representation being presented on this page. Uh, again, her language uh, features hyperbole. Whenever the focus is on uh, cartoons or comics, we get this uh, a hyperbolic um, register. Um, she has a tons, the value agent adjective uh, lovely. These convey her passion. Her narrative is uh, full of informal um, spoken features. A couple comic shops, should be a couple of comic shops, but that's a feature of um, US dialect, I think. Um, uh, the, the idiomatic phrase, uh, too bad and the elision M, these all sound, I guess, uh, like a very informal um, kind of spoken, spoken tone. Um, finally, uh, or towards the bottom of this extract, um, she is then exploring her relationship or what she sees as her relationship um, with different authors. Um, there's a range of proper nouns used in this, on this particular page um, which help present uh, relationships within the text. So, uh, and particularly Nisley's own perspective. So, if we consider the demonym, a demonym is a um, a proper noun that's derived from a geographical location. So, we get the Europeans really get their comic shops right. Uh, this proper noun, the Europeans, is very broad, um, and it contrasts with the specific um, personal first names of her pals, Sarah, Hope, and Brian. So here is someone who um, who knows intimately people in her own um, kind of comic uh, community back in the US, um, but here she can only speak of the Europeans a little bit more generally. Then towards the end of this page, um, she's using uh, the surnames of literary greats such as Hemingway, Wilde, uh, Sidaris, uh, Atwood, um, where she's using their surnames to, I guess, um, make a, a reference uh, or allusions to literature that will be understood by her readers. Um, there's some uh, writers on there that I'm very excited about as well, so I can relate to this text. 
Um, Nicely is also describing these people metaphorically, I think, as her familiar friends um, and how she says, I love them for themselves. Um, creating this sense of her kind of uh, what she feels is having an intimate personal relationship with these famous writers and of course that's uh, metaphorical because um, I don't think she's actually a friend of Ernest Hemingway because I doubt their lives even overlapped. Um, there is also uh, examples of uh, comic jargon on this page which is good I think for um, talking about um, uh, audience and the fact that um, one I suppose sub audience of this text would be the comic community and comic specialists I don't know what panel structure and scanning techniques really are this is jargon because it's aimed at specialist uh, audience with specialist understandings so finally then um, the extract finishes with a juxtaposition of setting and food and it has this sort of first person perspective we feel like we're um, we're looking up at Notre Dame with the um, sun shining all around it with this uh, the emanata representing the sunshine and we also feel that we've got a plate of food right in front of us we get this first person perspective um, of that too um, there are cultural allusions referencing um, referencing Notre Dame she references Victor Hugo who is sort of a famous French literary figure and Walt Disney who you will know is perhaps um, less literary but certainly no less famous or probably even more famous and I guess that's a combination of um, um, what you might call highbrow culture and popular culture a way of um, broadly accepting her audience will have different perspectives and different representations of Paris and she can connect with um, a range of readers through using these kinds of cultural references um, her language is as ever um, idiosyncratic and quite charmingly so um, her food is delish which I quite like this is an elision of the word delicious rather than have three syllables let's chop it down to two syllables let's put the stress on the opening D which wouldn't normally be stressed in poetry we would describe that as a spondy uh, because it has two stressed syllables delish a, a creative expression of delight uh, very idiosyncratic um, very personal uh, we got to the end so like nicely as the interjection goes woo okay um, Thank you for following this guided uh, annotation and for watching this video. I hope you found it useful. If you're interested in more analytical content like this to support you with your studies, then please have a close look at the playlist to see what else is on offer. Uh, get in contact with me via the comments to make a request. Um, I'm, I'd love to see your feedback um, saying what you thought worked or what perhaps I could do to improve what I'm doing here. Um, thank you again for your focus. Um, I hope it was useful for you and good luck with your studies.